keep us too long, just uh, there's not as many of us here today, which is good and bad. Um, the good part is we probably won't be an hour and a half today because there won't be as many people asking as many questions. But please, again, um, as last time, feel free to ask whatever questions you have. No, no, not too many, not too big, not too small type thing. So um, this part of the series is going to be, um, I titled it Budget is not a four-letter word. And basically in this session, we're going to learn to love the MRA budget model and plan our way to a successful 2019. So today's topic, we're kind of ending the year, it's December, so we're going to talk about getting ready to set your budget for 2019 for next year. Uh, and then next month is going to be preparing for your taxes. So I scheduled it early in January, I usually do my classes later, but I scheduled it early in January to kind of uh, work on some business tax write-offs, so let's talk about um, things that we can and can't include, and how you get ready to go through that process. So that's next month's class. So the first thing we're going to cover is creating your business budget. Determine how much you want to make, your net, not your gross. Work out your needed income in order to get to where you want to for how much you want to make, and establish your projected expenses, and how to effectively utilize your budget. Again. For me, um, I come, as Ernie and I were just talking, I come from a financial background, but coming into the real estate world, I had to learn the MRA budget model. Um, similar, not always the same, in how they like to see you um, put together finances under what categories, what's a subcategory, what's not a subcategory. Um, it's really a great model, and I've given everybody a couple handouts, which we'll go through. Um, the one here on top is a sample MRA profit and loss. This is, uh, you were in my last class, Leslie? Yes. So this is the more complicated version of the other profit and loss I gave you guys. The other one was very simplistic. This one's the more detailed, and it is small. I am going to send it to you electronically. Um, but this is the more detailed with all of them. You'll see on the right-hand side, it's got the different G, we call them GL, general ledger, account numbers that you would use for different items. So, for instance, um, an advertising would be a GL of uh, 6210. Um, and we encourage you guys to use the MRA model because that's what we use as a market center as well. I use the same exact numbers when I'm allocating expenses here for the market center. So we have office expenses, 6910, no question asked. We have advertising, 6210. Um, if I want to subcategorize that, I could say, like we were talking about last time, Facebook, Indeed, um, whatever the subcategory is, but it would become 6210-1, 6210-2, 6210-3. So you would add the dash in order to categorize it as a subcategory of that main category. And that's kind of how you would set up the profit and loss for yourself, okay? So this is just a sample. I know it's really teeny tiny trying to look at some of it, so I will send the electronic copy. The next paper I gave you guys is the chart of accounts. So this is really kind of like your Bible. It's going to tell you where, I hate the way it prints, so I'm going to have to work on it. Um, but it's going to tell you where to put something. So if you want to do advertising, again, 6210. If you want to put something under entertainment, other 6250. So it's just kind of like your guideline of where you should put things within your profit and loss. Um, and I know, Ernie, you were asking me earlier, this is exactly what I use when I'm doing the monthly for people that I do it for. I go based off, 100% off of the MRE budget model guidelines, okay? And then, uh, I think the three of you, but not you, Paul, uh, were, you guys got this checklist before. Never, never too many times you can have it, but this is basically some of the basics of what um, you can um, include for write-offs that are business expenses against your taxes, okay? So those are the handouts I gave you this time, and again, as I did last time, I'll send you the slide deck along with all of the attachments. Um, the profit and loss is in the form of an Excel, so you can actually use it, edit it, make it your own. It's just the more detailed version of the first one, which was very simplistic. Okay, so like we talked about last time, there are four MRA models. You've got the economic, the lead generation, the, the organization, and the budget, which is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to focus on how you spend your money. That's what our main focus of today is going to be. Um, what does your budget say? The budget model tells us, um, it answers if you should red light or green light an expense. 
It helps us determine how much money we can spend on specific expenses, helps us stay on track with our income, with the different sources of income, and it tells us if we're sticking to our budget. Okay? The budget model is based on using a profit and loss statement, also known as an income statement. So everybody knows that there are two sections to your overall finances, yes or no? I see a, I see a blank stare. So you have a balance statement, which is your asset and liabilities, and you have your income statement, which is your expenses and the money that's going out the door, cost of goods sold and incomes. Okay, so when we, and, and if you're using my services and, and you get a printout, you would get both. You'd get the balance and you would get the income statement. And the reason for both is you want to know what you have in assets and what you have in liability. You want to know what you have in your checking account. You want to know what you owe for loans. You want to know what you owe for a line of credit. Whatever that may be, that's your balance statement. And then you've got the income, which is your cost of goods sold and expenses. Make sense? So using the budget model, uh, the profit and loss uh, is, the, is the income statement because that's the, the statement here that I provided to you guys that tells us what our costs of goods sold are, what all of our expense categories are. A profit and loss tracks all of your income and all of your expenses. Two methods. Method one, we're going to start with our current actual expenses. We're going to determine what we currently spend, determine what we expect to spend, discover what you need to make to cover everything, and discover what you currently make. So that's method one, basically starting where you are right now. Method two is start at the end and work your way back. So we start with, and I think we briefly touched on this in the last class, you start with where you want to be for 2019, how much you want to make, and you work your way backwards. So we're gonna determine with how much we wanna earn each year, we're gonna determine what actions we need to make in order to take to make this happen, determine what our annual expenses are and put the budget in writing. Okay? First thing you're going to do is determine the number of weeks you plan on working this year. Why do I say that? Because you as a real estate agent, you, you run your own business. You determine if you're going to work 20 weeks, you're going to work 30 weeks. You determine how many weeks you're going to work. Okay? Keep it in mind that family and friends are essential. Make sure that you schedule out time to spend with people who matter. Don't, don't just work every day, every week, and forget that the people in your lives matter. Don't forget the holidays. Don't forget Christmas vacation. Take time off. Yes, we want to constantly be lead generating. Yes, we want to constantly be turning the numbers. But you also have to remember to take off time for those that are most important. Do you take a big vacation every year? Is it your standard to take two weeks off in July? Take those into account. You take time off around the holidays, any special birthdays or anniversaries. All of those things, when we're sitting down to make our budget, we need to take into account of how many weeks we plan on working in that year in order to now go backwards if we're going to use the second method. What do you want to take home by the end of this year? First step in determining that is determine your forecasted net income before taxes. How much do you want to end up with in your pocket by the end of the year? Is this a reasonable or is it stretch? Fill this out on the first line of the worksheet, which I didn't give you guys the worksheet this time. Tracks the GCI, not what you take home. So when we talk about income, we're talking about your GCI. If you recall in the last one, I talked about how the GCI was based on your um, your gross. So we have the gross, we have the net net, and then you have the net. Does everyone remember that conversation? Do I need to refresh that for anybody? No, we're good? Okay, so this is the total amount of commissions pays, paid at closing for your side of the transaction. This will include those cost of sales. So that's your overall income. That's the first thing we look at. How much did you bring home in totality, how much did you make on that sale in totality before anything was deducted out of it? That's your, that's your number one. Example, you represent the buyer who purchases a $300,000 home. The listing agent is offering 3% buyer to you. At closing, the total commission is $9,000. Your total commission for that deal is nine grand regardless of any splits, referrals, or et cetera. So your total income for that deal is $9,000. Okay. 
And I don't know if I have a, oh yes I do, perfect, I'm not going to go to it then. Profit and loss income section. So when we were just talking about this profit and loss that I showed you guys, this would be a, a blow up of the income section. So where I mainly, you can get down way, way more than what I would normally do. But what I would normally do is I would put everything under either residential or commercial income. To me, if you've got a sale, it's residential or commercial. Some agents prefer to say, okay, it's residential on the listing side, okay, it's residential on the sales side. Then you have a breakout saying that you got 5,000 in listing residential income and 5,000 in sales residential income and 10,000 in the listing side of commercial and 15,000 on sales side of commercial. So you can break it down further if you want to. Um, and then you've got uh, <coughs> other real estate income that would come in there and that could be the referrals. And you, can, you know, you, you send a deal to New York and you get a 25% referral on that, that's where other real estate income would come in. Because it's not your listing, it's not your sale, it's a uh, referral. And you could put it under, I guess, commercial and residential as well. So then, uh, just going back to this slide here, we talked about the total income. Um, what comes off of the total income would be our first line deduction. Do you remember? Split, splits? The co cost of sales, right, yes. Yeah. So your company dollar split is your cost of sales. Um, you might hear interchangeably called two different things, a cause, cost of sale, or a COG, which a cost of goods sold. Both are used in the accounting world, so you could hear it referred to either. Since I've been in Canada, I hear more cost of sale than cost of goods sold. Uh, but both mean the same exact thing. So that's the next section we talk about is our cost of sales. Track the cost of sales associated directly with the closing of a transaction. So example, your uh, loyal cap, royalty, um, should be local, not loyal, sorry, local cap, royalty, referral fees, and team commissions. Um, so all of those four items come off of that total income. Um, I generated $10,000 on a deal. I owe the Market Center $3,000. I also owe a $2,000 referral to Leslie. I've now assumed $5,000 cost of sale, and my net then becomes five grand. Understand? So you're going to determine your cost of sales. If you don't know your current cost of sales, I don't understand why the model says put 29.2%. It seems so silly to me. Rounds it up to 30% in this section. Uh, most of you, I think all of you, are in 70-30 in this room. Um, so 30% is your cost of a good sold. If you really want to get intentional with it, 36% because you have a royalty of 6%. So example one, the gross commission earned is $9,000. You have not yet capped, which means that you do have that company dollar portion. Cost of goods sold is the uh, GCI of $9,000. Your local market center cap of 30% in all of your cases, which is $1,800, minus the KWRI royalty of 6% at $540, making the total cost of sale $1,800 in commission and $540 in royalty. Everything else beyond those two numbers is your net number. Um, same example, $9,000, however you have capped, and you um, got that client because somebody referred it to you, so now you, I owe Leslie the 25%. The cost of goods sold in this case is the $9,000 minus the royalty fee of 25%. Uh, total cost of sale is the 25% at $2,250. Last example um, is the gross commission earned is $9,000. You have capped, but you were paying a buyer agent 40% for working with the client. So this is kind of in the, in the situation of a team setup. Um, you're paying a buyer agent 40% for working the client, so the cost of goods sold is $3,600 because it's the $9,000 minus the 40%. Any questions surrounding cost of goods sold or cost of sales? So again, just kind of a snapshot of the two um, sections there on your profit and loss. Section one, which is always 4,000 accounts. Um, so anywhere from 4,100 all the way down to 4,300 is your incomes. And the 5,000 accounts are already your cost of sales. Um, again, you can, commissions paid out, you can then subcategorize it into commissions to office, royalty, 
um, listing and buyer side cost of sales based on if you had to pay a buyer's agent or a listing agent, uh, and then other commissions paid out, which to me would be the referrals you're paying to other people. So the question is, why should we track the cost of sale and not just our take home income? you to be in business, right? So if, if we don't have a clear understanding of what our cost of goods sold is or our cost of sales are, then we're, we don't know how much it costs us to actually continue doing business for ourselves. If we just look at the gross number and say, yeah, I made $9,000, woo, we don't know what it cost us because we didn't earn $9,000. We didn't bring home $9,000. That's not what we put in our pocket. We all know that. Because then, as we talked about in the last one, this gets a piece of the pie, and that gets a piece of the pie, and that gets a piece of the pie, and the pizza pie is half gone by the time you get it, right? Uh, these are fixed expenses you cannot control except for renegotiating the cost. So it, it, it doesn't matter um, what, your, what your take on it is. At the end of the day, you have to pay 6% royalty to KWRI, and you pay 30% to us unless you get to the point where you can renegotiate those costs and then the cost of sale becomes less for you because you're getting us 20% versus 30. Still the same dollar amount, still the same 22,000, but it's the percentage that you're now giving away on every sale. Also, most agents don't truly know what it costs to be in business with both the broker and their team members. I see this time after time after time after time again. I have 15 clients that I'll still service in the St. John's Newfoundland office. And I had some very intentional and serious conversations when I started the market center. People had no clue what it actually cost them to be in business with us as a market center. They just knew that they got X amount of their bank account. I had an agent say to me one time, I don't look at my bank account, I just cash a check and hope it cashes. It doesn't bounce. Okay. And I hear it time after time after time again. Your business is a business. Run it like a business. Let's understand how much money you have as disposable income. Let's understand what it costs you by way of cost of sales to be in business with the market center. Agents and companies that don't have capped commissions, but perhaps a higher fixed commission may think that being on an 85-15 split with no cap is better than being on a 70-30 split with a cap. I see this with a lot of a lot of brokerages who have different setups. Oh, I just came from a brokerage where I'm 80 20 with no cap on the commission. Well, let me think about this. When you do the math and you're on 80 20 with no cap on how much you're paying me, are you really getting a better deal? Are you a high producer who is now paying the market center 40 grand versus R22 that's capped out? And this is the really intentional conversation that I've had because I, I don't work just with with Keller Williams agents. I've worked with agents from Century 21 Remax as well in my business. And it's a conversation that I've had with them over and over again. And it's, the, this, it's what I hear. Oh, I'm, I'm only 80, 20. Keller Williams, they charge 70, 30. Okay, well, let's look at the math. Some cases, it is, it is to their advantage. But become a higher producer, and it's no longer in your advantage. Right? So know, know what it costs you to be in business with us. By tracking the cost of sale, agents have a better financial picture of what it costs them to be in business with broker and the team members. So step three is determine your operating expenses. Um, again, they keep using this silly arbitrary 29.2%. I don't understand why KWU is doing this, but 30% is what we use. That's We talked about this in the last class. 30% no more than should be your operating expenses. There's then a breakdown, and it does go to it here in a few minutes, a breakdown within that 30%, but they recommend. Is this recording? Uh, it's supposed to be, yes. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> we went through this last time. Yes, yeah. I had like four of you that messaged me and go, I'm not getting the video. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to in case you just 
Everyday cost of your business um, can fluctuate and can get out of control quickly. So this is when we start using the red light, green light. So if we're, if we're keeping a profit and loss and we're tracking what we're spending and we understand that I spent $5,000 on Facebook for the year 2018 and $2,000 on business cards, we now understand where our dollars from the pizza pie is going and we can now say, okay, whoa, I don't need to spend $5,000 on Facebook ads. Let's budget that to X dollars. Let's budget that to 2,000 for the year and let's spend another thousand on signs or whatever needs to happen. Um, and some of these costs are, as I've listed here, office rent, copies, licensing, which we have no control over, it is what it is, signs, lock boxes, insurance, salaries, marketing expenses, training, meals, and more. Two of the business expense, two of the biggest expenses that I see, meals and entertainment, and client gifts. Two of the business, biggest ones I see coming from agents. So, um, yes, I agree with client gifts. I think it's an amazing thing to do. Um, again, be mindful of what you're spending is all I'm saying, because that all pulls into your at the end of the of end of the year profit. So here's that breakdown of the thirty what thirty percent should should look like. So the MREA says um, our operating expenses should never be more than thirty percent of our GCI. One of the biggest things I hear is I'm over thirty percent. I need to cut back on my expenses. Is that, is, that, is that fake or is that reality or how do we look at that? Well, it depends on your point of view. Make more money, get more deals, get more leads. Then you're increasing your income and your expenses are no longer over 30%. So it's, I guess it's a matter of, of how you're looking at it. Are you spending things that are necessary? Is that 30% are things that you cannot cut out? And if that's the case, then you just gotta make more money in order to offset it, right? So within that, and some of these would apply to you guys, so you're already ahead of some of the some of the ball game. So it says no more than 12% of your GCI should be spent on salary and benefits. So if you get to the point where you want to start a team, um, you're making $100,000 a year, no more than 12% of the $100,000 should be spent on salaries and benefits. That's the reality. Lead generation should be no more than 9.2%. Occupancy, which should be no more than 2%. And I'll just quickly backtrack to our last um, session. Occupancy could be uh, if you rent an office space here in the office. If you do not, then it's your percentage of your home office use within your home. Right? We had that conversation last time. Um, but you can't claim both. It's one or the other. So if you rent an office space, then you can't claim the other one. You've got to choose which one you're going to claim. So just out of curiosity on that one, um so say you have a thousand square foot place, you have uh, you know a hundred square foot office, so you can write off ten percent. So is that just ten percent of your home costs, or is there like a fee that you can allocate towards that? Or yeah, you know, no. It so it would be ten percent of all of your home costs. So ten uh, percent of mortgage or rent, whichever the situation. But just the interest on the mortgage, then, right? No nope, mortgage. The actual mortgage cost. 10% of the mortgage costs. So whatever your mortgage is for that month is 10% of that. If you have an alarm system, 10% of the alarm system. 10% um, of electric heating cost, hydro gas. 10% uh, of Wi-Fi. If you have a bundle, then you have to pull out the television portion, but you can do 10% of the telephone and 10% of Wi-Fi. Uh, cell phones, you can do it with 100%, because um, you can argue that your cell phone is almost your main means of communication for your business. Um, if you have homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance, 10% of that. Uh, just remember some things are HST applicable and some things are not. So when you're going into that, putting things into your world, knowing which one's insurance would not be HST applicable. Because you're keeping track of all these expenses, some of them become the ITCs to write off of the, the HST that you remit. So some things are, are HST remittable and some things are not. So um, medical insurance never have HST on them. You don't pay the HST, so it's not a write off for HST. Did I confuse you even more now? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, th okay. I, I think I've got a fairly decent handle on how, how it works. Yep. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of that stuff, I mean, you know, I, I've always just sort of gone by if I feel like it's something that I've added then for my business and, you know, spending this money in order to make money, mm -hmm. then it's tax deductible. And 
it's in most cases, personal yes. use, and obviously, you know, it is. Right, so then you're doing yourself a disservice, okay? Because you're operating at your home. Like, as, as a real estate agent, your, your home is your base of operations, yeah. right? So if you've got 10% use of your home, uh, I personally would sit down and say, my mortgage is 2000 my electric is 150 my Wi-Fi is 98 my whatever, add it all up and do 10%, and that becomes 10% monthly that's coming off of your income as well. Yeah. That's coming off of your expenses. Yeah, I mean, the, the way, goal at the end of the day is to offset how much taxes you're paying to the tax man. Yeah, I mean, it, my situation is a little different. I don't want to complicate right. things, but um, I have two renters, so I sort of walk by 33% of my home, I feel. Mm -hmm. But then because 10% of my home is my home office, mm -hmm. then really I change the number to 30%, so I write off 70% of my expenses. Okay. The only one that I, the only one out of what you've said so far, I mean, with the TV bundle, I get that. It's just the internet portion stuff. Yeah. The only one that I've um, done differently, I just got a home phone line, and I was almost going to write that off completely because the only, I have one phone that's As long as you can desk, justify it. And it's not Absolutely. for personal use. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was, I was always under the impression that it can only be the interest on the mortgage, not the court that's paying back the principal of it. But that I could be different. But when it comes to renters, write off, like... Yeah, it's a bit different with your situation. You're, you're only able to write off, like, the interest that's you're being charged right. on the mortgage. Right, it's a bit different with renters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll get back to you. I'll okay. table that question and message you back properly. Okay. If you have two incomes coming in do you, and you're using a portion of your home, do you split that in half again? So you say it's 10% of your home. So, so you're really, talking about with income splitting for spouses? Like you're what, yeah, so basically, yeah. you know, you still you just use 10%. Okay. Yeah. And you think it's the interest only and you're saying mortgage and interest or just mortgage? Uh, mortgage. Okay. It cheats. Uh, I don't know. With rent, you could write off 10% of the rent. So why wouldn't you? Write I know. It, it, it might be different. The thing is, if you have an income property right. and you have renters, you can only deduct the interest off the mortgage, right? Because you could have bought that in, that income property with cash, right? And then you're not, you know, the the expense to you is not the principal repayment. But it's, the renters are not within your living space and where you're operating. Your right. Business. That's that's why I think Melissa might be right. Like I, I think. For a home office, I think the rules are a little different. Little different. I've just understood it because of the, the rental yeah. income. And you know, if you know, if you, like I said, if you have a renter, you can only write off the interest on the mortgage. Yeah, so um, I know I talked about this last time, and everyone gave some amazing uh, suggestions of some of the free services. I use QuickBooks because I find it's really easy. You can do a reoccurring, hit it, reoccurring, hit it, reoccurring, and then you're only editing like your electric fluctuates unless you're on a fixed payment plan. So you'd go in there and you would edit the electric amount. Um, if you're doing your own and you're preparing it for an accountant, um, my biggest recommendation is to figure out which way you're going to do it. And I mean, um, whether you're going to every month deduct it by the 10% and only put in the 10% amount, or if you're going to put the full amount and at the end of the year have your accountant slash it by 10% for you. But don't mix and match. And this comes into play with um, car expenses as well, automobile. So it's easier if you're doing it one way and you tell the accountant at the end of the year, I have a 10% threshold for home expenses and an 80% threshold for auto expenses, slash it off there for me, and you're putting the full amount, right? Or do it the other way and say, I've already allocated and the amount that you see is with my 10% or 80%. So that's the way I do it. I put the numbers in there the way they're supposed to be based on my percentages. When it gets to, I do my own taxes, but when it gets to me at the end of the year, I, I already know that I put in the percentage. And my clients are the same way. They just go to their account and said, this has already been adjusted by 10%. This has already been adjusted by 80%. These are actual numbers for you. Yeah. So just make sure you're aware of that and not mix and matching. Right? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I do it just the opposite way. I just you track, do the whole amount. I, I track like what I've spent yeah. throughout the year, and I have it all sort of itemized on a spreadsheet and stuff like that. And, and then, then at the end of the year, you. I'll, I'll, well, I'll even adjust, I'll just add a new right. column and put like, you know, if I feel like the car was 90% used right. for business or something, I'll just put the 90 Which is fine too, yeah. It'll shift it off. With the car one though too, I guess there's a different way because you can do like a kilometer allocation versus like a, 
Uh, Actual yeah, and I find, just out of honesty, with all the agents I've ever done, the kilometer doesn't add up anywhere near what your write-off is when you claim 90% of everything, or 80% of everything. Depends on if you have a, a new car, or you know, if you've got a lease, or, or, or you bought a car if you're driving a 1985 Chevy down the road. Right. I think it depends on if you, my, my, my point is whether the car is paid off or it's not. Right. You take into consideration, like my situation, if I were a realtor, I got a $600 a month car payment. You take 90% of that, I can already tell you that I'm going to be better with all of my costs and my insurance than if I did per kilometer. Right, right. In St. John's anyway. Yeah. Because everything was within five kilometers. Yeah. Right? Uh, here, if you're driving from here to Barry or here to Kitchener, you might be better off doing the government standard rate based on per kilometer. Then you got to keep a kilometer book. Yeah. With that last time, everyone frowned at me. <laughs> I keep my kilometer book. There's apps too that work very well. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody have questions? Did you have a question or anything? No. no. You have any? Okay. okay. So um, just kind of continuing down. Communication technology is at one and a half. Education dues at one. Auto at one percent of your total GCI for the year. Um, one percent for equipment, equipment and furnishings. One percent at supplies and office expenses, and a half a percent at insurance. They have nothing for other and nothing for <coughs> professional services. Um, again, if you need to add more in one category, the, the goal is to subtract from another category in order to stay under that thirty percent. So. We already know that most of you don't have salary benefits, so you could then allocate that to something else and be able to spend a bit more there. Um, and then this little column would be used for you to actually write out your dollar amount. So if you know this year your GCI is going to be 150, you would take 150 at 12 percent and know what your dollar budget, based on the model, would be for each category. Uh, I'm going to kind of whiz past that, but that's the expense um, general ledger account. So same thing as what I showed you guys and what every other general ledger looks like. You have a main category, uh, lead generation, and then you have subcategories of that for the different types. So occupancy, rent, utilities, repair, maintenance. So again, it's subcategorizing those things so you know exactly. You're not just saying I spent $5,000 in advertising and you're going... Well, what I spend five thousand advertising on. You now know you spent two thousand on Facebook. You spent a thousand on Indeed. You spent five hundred on whatever. You know exactly where your advertising dollars went, so you can make a better informed decision. Go the next year. Did I really did that produce me any returns? And do I need to continue spending that much money? Okay, so we kind of did some of these examples last time. So if I'm looking at the general ledger accounts for the 6200 for lead generation, where would I put a purchase for a listing sign? If I were to get a listing sign for something, where would that go into my general ledger? Advertising? Yeah. Um, what about the cost of renewing your license? Dues. Dues, yeah. Very good. And uh, an assistant. Administration. Or salaries. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, so salaries and then administrator. So yeah. 61, 120. The other thing it could be, just as a, a side note for anybody who might be looking to hire somebody to do contractual things, you wouldn't actually put that under salaries, you'd put it under contract labor. So, for instance, if you were to come to, I'm not going to use me because that'd be bad. You go to Caitlin and you say, hey, Caitlin, I need help with this service. Can you do this for me? And posting ads on Kijiji, boosting posts on Facebook, whatever, and you'd agree to pay her $10 an hour, that would be contract labor, not salary. You don't want to get into salary unless you're actually paying salary employees. So, this is a question, but what, what are the uh, numbers on the side? So that's the general ledger account numbers. Okay. Uh, very simply put, it's an accounting way of knowing um, where everything falls. So let me go back one page. And do we have access to that? Can like we use that? Uh, yeah, so I gave you one of the handouts actually has all the GLs. Um, but also I'm going to be sending you these handouts via Excel. Mm -hmm. So I was explaining to my, I think you had just missed it, Mariana. Oh. Um, this is the profit and loss that I'm going to send you guys, which is a bit more detailed than the other one I sent you last class. So on the sides here, you'll actually see these little tiny numbers, which is hard to see in this 
format, but those are the general ledger accounts, which is exactly the same as what's up here. So um, each category you'll see, so expenses are what we call 6,000 level category accounts, that's all expenses. Um, each category at the top, the main category is a 6,100 or 61,000, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, it must be 100. That's salaries and benefits. And then every time we have a subcategory under that, it goes down to something different. So 6110, 6110, 20, 61, blah, blah, blah. So every time you go into a subcategory, it then adds two and a three and a four and a five to let you know that you're now subcategorizing the main category. But these codes, like, are they standard for all businesses or? Yes. Yeah. So all businesses on the back side and the accounting side will have a GL associated with it. So and we set that state. up in say, QuickBooks. So you would set it up in QuickBooks, right? Oh. Yeah. So but if anybody ever got these codes. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. And the easy way, if anybody ever wants to do QuickBooks, I already have uh, an Excel that has the MREA format that we just import into QuickBooks and it sets it up for you. So if you're using So if somebody QuickBooks, wants to do QuickBooks, I can provide that. So using QuickBooks, then we wouldn't use this. No. It's, it's the same thing except in QuickBooks. Yeah, a lot easier. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and so QuickBooks is free. No. Oh. What, what? So this, this this on KW website. I'm gonna send it to you. Okay. But so you're gonna send us the one. Sorry. I'm gonna send you this one. The one that we can upload in QuickBooks. I'll send you that one if you want. Yeah. I can I'll attach it. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's basically it's not like this. It's just um, a GL and then the name. And then what happens is if you open up QuickBooks and you want to use it, you go um, to where it's set. And I, you can come in, I can always help you with this. Um, import a chart of accounts, upload that file, and it imports this whole thing with the names and the GLs right for you. Uh, and it Does it form. matter which one we, like, I don't why, why do you suggest, you suggest QuickBooks? Because QuickBooks is easy. So you go into QuickBooks. We have time. Does anybody, does anybody have any objections? We have time. Is that so. okay with everybody? Go. Okay. Is this a monthly fee for QuickBooks? There or? is, yep. So um, QuickBooks on normal for the basic is, I believe, $14.99. I do have a, because I'm a bookkeeper, I have a, a special rate that they give me that I can send out as a referral and you get 50% off of that rate for a year. 50? 50. Oh, 50. For one year. For one year. And then it bumps up from there. And again, this is a business expense, so it's a write-off of those expenses, right? So I'll go into, because I don't mind, I'll go into my personal, I can't go into my clients. So this is QuickBooks. This is what it'll look like if you were to come onto the dashboard. It's as easy as going to expenses. And so this is expenses that I've done. I could do a new transaction. So, and you, the good thing about this is you can sync. So again, I talked about having your own business account. If you have your own business account, you can actually sync it to QuickBooks. So now you have a business checking account operating, you'd be able to sync that to QuickBooks. And every transaction that you made, money in or money out, would actually pull into QuickBooks for you. Right? So it would be less work for you. If you're using that business account exclusively, then every transaction that's business related becomes here. And what happens is QuickBooks then remembers, you go to ESO, three times in a row and you're marketing it as a gasoline expense, the next time you go in, it's going to say, oh, ESO is a gasoline expense. Oh, Staples is an office supply. Oh, like it remembers what you're categorizing that expense at for you because you do it often enough. You can change it, you can override it. If you went to Staples and it's not an office supply, it becomes a technology or whatever, you can override it and change the category. So, so I mean, if you, you go to Staples and you use your credit card, it automatically syncs with if you if you have the if you have it synced. Wow. Yeah. So right. like I personally I have a business savings, a business checking, and a business credit card. So every time I use my business credit card, um, it pulls the transactions in for me. The next time I sign in, I just review them, I click it and it adds it to my profit and loss for me. 
it pulls the transactions wow. from my business checking account for me and it says you've got a five thousand dollar deposit which invoices could you invoice which invoices does this match click 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 these clients there's my five thousand dollars it's in my profit and loss for me does it pull the hst so you can it does everything so then you technically don't need to then input that receipt right it's already there. Trans, as long as you're using the accounts right and that's why that's why i was kind of talking about the last time so when i'm when i'm building off of every class i kept saying the last time get an operating separate business account yeah. this is part of why because now you can go into another aspect that's going to save you time you don't have to input oops, you don't have to input that receipt now because you've now gave it the ability to pull right from an account that's only designated as business expenses it's going to pull right in the expense is now there and you're all done you don't have to sit and go through your shoebox of receipts and and Put them in. Yeah. You actually yeah, you will need get, to keep the receipts. You will, you will need to keep the receipts. Yeah. You don't need to do You can archive anything. them. And you're still going to get the occasional, I paid cash or I sure. had to put it on another card because I forgot this right. one. Right, but that's a whole bunch of stuff right? you don't have to do. Yeah, for sure. Because, yeah. That's good. Yeah. So this would be what QuickBooks expense would look like. I would come in here if I wanted to pay something. I have it set up a bit different just the way I do my accounting. If I wanted to pay Bell Alliance for my Wi Fi, the data payment. The type, I paid it on check. I'd go here, I'd select an account. So this is a telephone expense, or I think it's actually Wi-Fi. Now, uh, internet. Internet, which is a subcategory of utilities. I click on it. This is December Wi-Fi. I put in the amount, $500. I'm saying that it's HST applicable. So it's now telling me you had a $500, oh, wait, let's do it inclusive of. You can do exclusive or inclusive. So I'm going to do $500 inclusive. So I, mean, I paid $500 to Bell Alliant with HST included. The HST portion of that $500 is $65.22 for a total expense of $500. So now what happens is it figures out, yes, I want to leave without saving. You can go here to taxes at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, because you've got all these expenses in here, it's calculating what the HST is, you can now go in and say, from um, October 1st to December 31st, I owe 198.58 of all of the HST that I've collected. And I'm very diligent about writing off every single thing that I can. Now I've got a lot of income, like I haven't done my QuickBooks in several months because of the move and stuff, so I've got a lot of income and crap that's not in here. But um, makes it that easy. So what happens now, it would actually, I would go in here and I would click on it and I would probably file, it's a little bit different. Um, I would go in there and I'd be able to click on it because it's not due yet. There would be a button that said file this return. You click on that button. Uh, it pulls up a report and you take that report to your online filing service and you put in the numbers just as it says and off it goes. You don't have to manually calculate anything. You don't have to keep a spreadsheet. It does it all for you. It's now tracked that you had X amount of income, you had X amount of expenses, and here's what the HST was, and here's how much you need to remit. And can you file your income tax through QuickBooks as well? Uh, no. Okay. It gives you, what it does is it spits out, let's see if I can pull one. It'll spit out a report by the management report. So you could get this report. I'll just do this one. It's not done yet, but that's fine. So you would just pull up a management report that would look like this. This is what I would, that's what I was explaining earlier, what I provide to my clients. It looks like this. So at the end of the year, it basically has what your profit and loss is. Um, it then has all of the expenses that you've spent money for. So it gives you your total expenses in each subcategory. So I had moving costs this year. Uh, so that's total moving costs, total office expenses, total other expenses. Your total expenses are 26,000. So you see, like I really write off <laughs> as much as I can based on how much I earn. Um, I probably, I've written off more than I've actually earned this year so far. And that's making sure that you do the business expenses, making sure that you do the um, automobile expenses, really following this list and trying to find as much as you can in order to offset. So at the end of the year, I know there's a lot of income not here yet though. At the end of the year, I probably show myself as a $5,000 positive. 
when I may have earned thirty five thousand in my bookkeeping. Like it just is because I'm so diligent about that income and versus expense. And that's the trick. Um, is to really make sure that you're claiming every dollar that you can claim, that the CRA allows you to claim. So with the uh, QuickBooks, you know, after, like, you still have to go to your accountant. Yeah, so this is what I was explaining to Ernie early, earlier in the day. You would take this report that I'm showing you right here, you would take this to your accountant so that's it. You and give it to them, and, and that'll be it. Nothing else, just that. They don't need receipts. As long as this is done, and this is done accurately with the receipts and everything being all the income input and categorized correctly, all of the expenses input and categorized correctly, this is what they need. Because now what they're going to do is they're going to go through and they're going to say, okay, my income was this, my cost of goods sold was this, the total automobile was this, and that's already the 80% mark, the home expenses were this, and that's already the 10% mark. They're just going to take it and they're going to transfer it over and they're going to look at you and they're going to say, okay, Mariana, you owe five grand. And that's it. You've now paid the accountant maybe one hour, two hours of your time versus six hours of your time. So that's where you reduce your cost in the accounting fees. But the, like you have QuickBooks. Is there any other way, like for example, a spreadsheet? That yeah. have formulas in there. Yeah, so I've got. Were you? Did I send you the last one, the really simple accounting one? Okay, so I'll send. The, I'll make sure I send the simple accounting one as well. Uh, it was very easy. A lot of people like the look of it. Um, I don't know if I have. So this is the simplified profit and loss um, that I showed you guys last time. Okay. So this one's very easy to use. It's just a very basic category. So you have income at the top, which is the green, orange, which is cost of sales, and then expenses, which is red. You can uh, expand it and add subcategories if you want by putting it in a new row, and the formulas will maintain themselves. And I've got a bunch of numbers in here to show you guys. So what happens here is as you go along at the top here, you put in your um, listing GCI, you put in your sales GCI, and it gives you your total income in GCI. You do that every month as you go along, and at the end of the category, it's going to tell you this is how much you earned. This is how much you had in cost of sales. This is how much for each one of these categories you spent in expenses, and this going down, um, other income, other expenses, this was your bottom line. Um, this was your bottom line number. Net. Your nets, correct. This is your bottom line net. Your single net. Correct. Not your net net. Your single. No, net. Your, no, your yeah. Net. <laughs> yeah. So this is your bottom line. This is what you profited after you got the income. You subtracted the cost of sales. You subtracted your expenses. That's your income that you're going to be taxed on. That you're going to be taxed on. So that is pre-tax. Correct. So, and remember, just so you guys know, because I've, I've sent this out from people going, it's not calculating, you have to change your year to date through. So there's a little drop down here, and you change it to the month. Mm -hmm. So if you say year to date through April, you can see here the number changed to 4,000. Year to date through December, the number changed to 12,000. So okay. this is a really simple, easy to use profit and loss for somebody who's just kind of getting started and doesn't know where to begin. Um, but just make sure you're doing the correct year-to-date through number. It's not going to calculate. You're going to be like, well, I'm adding stuff, but it's not adding. Just make sure that that's done. Okay. So I'll, I'll send this out to you on this time. You can ask a question? Just yawning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Don't want to miss anybody. Yeah. <laughs> now it's in conjunction with QuickBooks. You're doing that. I, I, I wouldn't. Absolutely not. Just doing just Quick, your, Just one or the other. You don't need to do more than one. Just one or the other. If you're using QuickBooks, QuickBooks does everything you need for you. It's going to create that profit and loss. 
It's going to keep track of each subcategory. It's going to spit out a report like I just showed you. It's going to spit out this report that says, here's what my bottom line numbers are. And oh, by the way, not only do I now know that under moving expenses, I know that I spent that much in gasoline to move, I spent that much in hotel, I spent that much in meals, I spent that much in moving labor. So it now gives you that subcategorized line where you can now go, eh, I don't think next year I'm gonna spend $3,000 in moving expenses, right? right? Which I wouldn't anyway, but. So it gives you that ability to red light and green light. It now gives you the ability to pull, and if you notice in here, there are a whole so chalutal of reports that you can use. So QuickBooks, is it easy to learn? Or is it's it easy fun? to learn. I taught an agent to use it in a, a one-hour session. They have tutorials throughout. They have tutorials through there, yeah. yeah. But it's very simple. I, I can Anybody who wants to learn to use it, I'm happy to sit down and to teach you the basics. And if you need to come in a couple different times, there's several times she called me over the phone and said, tell me again how to do that. And I'd say, you go, bop, bop, bop. And she's like, oh, OK, that's easy. And she just kept using it. And she uses it to this day. She loves it. And you mentioned the cost of it. What was it? Yep. So I believe it's $14.99 per mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. Yep, and if I send you the referral code, which I'd send it to you via email, you get 50% off for a year. So you could use it for a year and then re-decide. You, you, could even, you could even be cheap and do what I've had somebody else do and cancel it after the year, and then when the new year starts, have them resend the code again, and then you get another half off again. The only problem with that is your data doesn't carry over, right? It's not, not a recommended thing to do, but for them, it was worth it. Because then you're resetting up the entire new QuickBooks. You're setting up the cost. You're setting up all of the chart accounts again. You're re-putting in all your data. You're linking your accounts, so on and so forth. So back. To, so if we sign up for QuickBooks, you would send us a file with everything already set up. I just send you a, an Excel document. It, yep. Oh, you're right. And, and yep. Import it and then okay. Yeah. So you would go here to uh, <laughs> chart accounts. So this is kind of what we we're talking about: chart of accounts. Um, I don't have a setup to where I get all those crazy. 6,000 numbers because I don't care what those numbers mean. I just want the titles. I just want to know that it's accounting, you know, Facebook under accounting or gasoline under automobile or, you know, dues under whatever. Um, so I don't have to set up with the numbers. You can. So basically, all you do is you go here to new and you would go to import and you're going to pull that Excel, that CSV Excel file okay. right in and it, it's all there. It just pulls it right in for you. Yeah, it's so easy. So if anybody who wants help with that going forward, you can um, message me and I'm happy to uh, help anybody with that. Okay, so kind of moving forward, I can jump past some of these because we did these. So we're here. So if I were to say um, you're going to family reunion, you're now going to have meals and hotel associated with family reunion, where would you put that? Doesn't give you very many options here, but. Other education. Or education training. Say other education things. Yeah, so I don't actually agree with this. I think I'm going to change the slide. Um, I think we might have briefly touched on this in the last one. So the actual, oh, it's registration. Sorry, yes, the actual registration goes under education and training. I must be looking at a different slide. The next one. Yeah, so the actual registration goes under education and training. Okay, because you're it's an educational course that you're going to. But if you have meals and hotels for family reunion, I don't, there should be a whole other subcategory in my mind. You can put it under two places. You could put it under education and dues, and you could say other educational dues, or you can create another subcategory that's called. Correct. Travel. Travel. That, that's where I would put it. I'd put it under travel, and then a subcategory called meals and entertainment <coughs> under travel. My airfare would be, um, would be airfare under travel. My hotel would be hotel under travel. My automobile would be taxi, automobile and taxi cost and under travel. Yeah. That's how I would do it, and that's how I do do it when I travel. I put all of those costs associated not under the education, because to me, that's not an educational cost, that's a travel cost. And as an agent, if you are traveling in, there's only two qualifiers, if you are traveling in order to conduct business, 
that is recognized in your profession, it then becomes a travel expense that is tax deductible for expenses. If you go somewhere, let's say I travel to Montreal next week, I conduct one meeting on a week-long vacation, I now can classify that as a travel expense for business. The whole trip? The whole trip. And everything that you ate there 100%? Technically. Because I conducted a meeting, but you have to be careful with that as an agent because why are you going to Montreal when your license is held in Ontario? Right? So again, it's got you it's gotta make sense. If I'm going to Kingston, I'm gonna get a hotel there and I'm whatever, or to Niagara, I'm gonna get a hotel there, I can write that off because I'm conducting lead generation, oh, I'm conducting whatever. Having a conversation with an agent. Not Keller Williams agent, when you're talking about coming into the Keller Williams pool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so you just gotta be careful can... with how can you justify it if CRA knocks on your door. Right. Family reunion is an event that is a Keller Williams function, that the entire thing is, I'm, I'm staying three or four extra days. The entire thing becomes a tax write off at that point. Even though three or four days is business, I conducted it, it was a business trip that the purpose of going there was solely to conduct business. But those three or four extra days that you spent there, like, you shouldn't break your meals off for those days? Or? I do. Yeah. I will. Yeah, because, because I went there. I did not go there with the intention of conducting a vacation. I went there with the intention of conducting business. Yeah. The vacation is right? secondary. The vacation became secondary because I'm there. Right. Now, yeah. I also have some MCA events. I, I coordinated dinner for all the MCAs across the US and Canada. I do some other things, so I'm required to be there a few days early. I just happen to want to go to the aquarium and to Bourbon Street and, you know. <laughs> so it's, it becomes common sense at that point. What can you then justify if Sierra was sitting in front of you? Well, yeah, I, I was there three or four extra days, but we come from Toronto, it's an entire travel day, it's three flights, it's Jet lag, jet lag, I gotta be there, there's one event on Tuesday morning, even though it's at 9 a.m., I can't get a flight out until 6, so I decided to wait until the next day, like, yeah. what can it become justifiable at that point? Does that make sense? I don't know if I would necessarily use that example if you're going to Cabo San Lucas and say for a week and talking to somebody for five minutes. You might get dinged on that one, but... <coughs> or like in your example, like your aquarium entrance fee. Right now. Unless you're taking clients. Well, if you're taking clients. Right? Sure. Then, then right on your receipt, I'm taking clients to the aquarium as a closing gift, or I bought aquarium tickets for a client to whatever. Right? I know for a fact some of my clients probably consume 20 bottles of, of alcohol, but they're all got receipts on them that say client gifts. Who am I to ask? Like, you're telling me you bought it as a client gift. I just know the person. Yeah. So, <laughs> CRA, at the end of the day, it can only take it what you said. And if it's not an absurd amount, I've got one person every month I have to say to them, now I know you didn't take $800 worth of clients out for meals and entertainment this month. Let's rein that back a little bit. And that's kind of my job as a bookkeeper. You're going to get flagged on $800 every month because there's no way you're taking clients for $800 worth of food every month. Especially if it says kids meal, and so my job is to say to her, "Hey, like I'm not putting that receipt in there." So it's just kind of balancing and realizing what's what. Okay, so uh, how much you make? So income minus cost of sale minus expenses equals the net profit. The net profit is what is become taxable. So again, going back to what I was saying, the goal is to get as much cost of, well, cost of sale you can't control, but as much expenses off of the income as you can in order to make your taxable income as low as possible. What are the guidelines? Uh, know how to read your profit and loss, track income expenses, um, and I don't know why I have now, what are the guidelines? So your final step is step four. Net income as a percentage of your gross commission income. So we're going to take 100 minus your cost of sales percentage, minus your operating expenses, and that's going to leave your net income, and that becomes the percentage. So 100% minus 30% minus 30% equals 40% is your net income. So there's this neat little chart that I found um, somewhere in Keller Williams' world. I found it. So 
here is, it's just a quick chart to figure out what your net income to your GCI is. So if you have a net income this year of a $100,000, and they're using that arbitrary percentage again, your cost of sales on $100,000 then becomes um, $70,000. Your expenses is $70,000, and that made your GCI $240,000. So it's just a quick, quick way to figure out based on the MRA model what your GCI would be if you did the 29.2 to 29.2. What? You said that. Please. It'll be in this slide. Yeah. The whole thing will come to you. So then again, you see kind of how things as you go, you go up higher in your GCI, how it works out to your net. So you can use it the opposite way, right? So you can say. You've got a GCI of three hundred thousand. You're now expense, you know, of three hundred thousand, eighty per eighty-seven thousand would be your threshold for expenses. Eighty-seven thousand would be your threshold for cost of goods sold, which means that you would walk away with one hundred and twenty-five before taxes. Average twenty-five to forty percent for taxes. In that situation. Okay, hey, so then we talk about the MRA guidelines. Again, uh, cost of sales 30%, expenses are 30, profit is 40%. As business owners should be able to net 40% of your gross commission income for owning your business. So, a lot of people say I only walk away with half. If you are keeping 40%, you're doing very well. If you're, if you're keeping more than 40% of your total commission, um, that's awesome. If it's less, then you need to go back and you need to revisit this process and say, where am I, where am I bleeding my money to from? Where in my expense process? And it's not a cost of sale issue, because we know a cost of sale is set based on what the market says or what we've agreed on, 30% and 6%. At some point, the 6% goes away when we hit 3,000, the 30% goes away when we hit 22, and then everything else becomes gravy. But if you're, if you're, if you're under the 40%, then we know we are spending too much in expenses. And that's where we have to go back and we have to look at line by line what we're spending in expenses and go back to the first theory where it says you have to understand what it costs for you to be in business. Run the business like a business. Keep in mind when you're performing in a role, you're getting that income as well. So if somebody uh, here were on a team and you are working as a buyer agent on that team, you're not only earning your own, but you may be earning additional money for that role. Just a little side note for anybody who might be in a team situation. So create a budget. Uh, use the MRE chart of accounts which I provided you, and I'm going to send you guys all via email today. There is a natural rhythm to business which demands that you examine your books at least once a month. Now, I showed you guys a glimpse into my QuickBooks. I haven't done my books for probably six months. Horrible on me, not like me. I'm normally every month. So I usually do mine the first of the following month. So November 30th comes and goes. By the end of the first week following end of month, I usually have everything situated for that month. Um, the reason I recommend monthly, and a lot of agents go, oh, I gotta do this every month, to wait until the end of the year is a nightmare. I have seen people, friends, I've seen pictures on Facebooks where they're sitting on the living room floor and their shoe boxes and their stock of receipts everywhere all around them and they go to stand up and they've got a mess colliding and everything's falling everywhere and I'm going, what are you doing? Like, do it every month. All you have to do is take literally one to two hours on the first Saturday, the first Sunday, the first Friday night, whatever you want to set, and go in. If you use the QuickBooks and you have it synced over, it's even less time. Right? Just do it on a monthly rhythmic basis. You want to say something? Yeah, just, just a tip on, like, I don't use QuickBooks, and yeah. I mean, I would consider it, but what I do um, is I just have, like, an app on my phone, like a notes app. Yep. And I just record what I spend awesome. when I spend it. Yeah. And then later on when I have time, I'll just translate that into my spreadsheet. To your spreadsheet, awesome. My computer, and that way yeah. I don't really worry so much about the receipts that I have. So is your spreadsheet kind of like a profit and loss spreadsheet, or is it just it, it's a, similar a bit to different. your basic one that you yes. have there, but it's a little more complicated. Okay. And I have it broken down into personal expenses, house expenses, and business expenses. Awesome. Um, so I have my rental income and different right. things like that. And then I have, I track all of my regular things that come up each month 
that I know I'll have a line item for those. And then for things that are like business expenses that I don't really, like they're, they're sort of variable and they come and they go, I have a separate page for house expenses and a separate page for real estate expenses where I just go line by line. Right. And then I total up what is at the and end And how long month. does it take you to do that? Do you do it on a monthly basis? I, it's not necessarily on a monthly no. basis, it's just whenever I want to sort of like okay. clear what I've got on my phone into my spreadsheet gotcha. and have like an hour here or there. Right. It doesn't take too long. Right. Um, there's a little bit of, like I could make it a little bit better and a little bit more standard to the way that, and I've, I've adjusted it over the years to make it a little bit easier to send to the accountant so I don't yeah. have to do as much back tracking work. Um, but, uh, you know, I like the system of just keeping it on your phone as you make a transaction because that way I just know at least I've, I've kept that record. And then I feel comfortable that I've kind of captured everything that I've spent in right. the year. So that's great. That's a great system. You've got a system, I guess, is the, the key, right? Yeah. If you have something that works for you, it's keeping you accountable. You're able to go backwards. You're able to see what you've spent where. You're able to now understand where your business is at at any snapshot point in time. Yeah, and that's, you know, I think, the key. The key is to, to be able to understand today I am net profits of 5,000 or I am a deficit of 5,000. Like, I think it's important to understand where you're at so that you can run your business like a business. Yeah, and I like that the QuickBooks can kind of run that report, but the way that I do it is when I get to the end of the year, I just save my spreadsheet as the budget for the next year, yeah. and then I kind of clear out some of the notes, but I leave a lot of the amounts in there yeah. so that I can predict what I would spend the next year. That's it's great. usually pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of what I do as a market center too, right? We, we, we look at what, like I just actually turned it in for our market center here. I looked at what we spent for all of 2018, what months I went over in some budget areas, and I did kind of the same thing. Everything transferred over to 2019 with a few adjustments saying, okay, well, you know, we've hired somebody new, we've gotten rid of somebody, or um, we now are looking, or... rent's gone up, or we're looking at going to Lambton more, and so whatever the case may be, yeah, we have we have difference in, in, in numbers, and that's where I'm going to adjust. So you're kind of doing the same thing with what we do at the market central level, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and so with assist, we use the chart of accounts. Um, so then budget, so kind of what he was just talking about, Paul was talking about there, you're going to start with the blank profit and loss. Um, you can download the MRE Profit and Loss from Color Inc., but I am going to send it to you and save the work. You're going to fill in your income amounts, how much you, you'll make, so that's kind of taking in what you want to make. So you set a goal for yourself, 300000 next year, 200000 whatever it is you want to make in GCI. Then you're going to uh, take into account 30% for cost of sale, 30% for expenses, um, and that's going to give you what the net income is. Uh, and use Excel, like you were talking about, use Excel is not hard. If you, if you don't want to invest in something like the QuickBooks, I, I talk about it a lot because it's just what I naturally use, but Excel works just as brilliantly. So sit down and figure it out, use Excel. Um, I'm going to try to get hold of my own team leader in Newfoundland. He's got something called the Freedom Number. It's an Excel document that works much like what we're talking about. You basically input what you want to make for the year. You put in what you currently spend on some key expenses, and it spits out a number and says, in order to make this much, you you have to uh, you have to gross this much. So you have to get this much in GCI in order to get this much in net. So you're working from your net number, saying, okay, I'd like to bring home a hundred thousand dollars next year. What does that look like? That take into account that thirty percent and that thirty percent, and this is my GCI that I have to make in order to, to net that. So that's really where we all want to get. We all want to get to the point we understand in order to make, truly make, to net X amount of dollars, what does that look like in, in, in whole dollars, right? So I'm going to see if I can get that from him. I know he's um, in Austin this week, but um, I'll try to get us in. Austin. Sounds similar to the one that uh, they, some guys said he did when I went to see Glenn McQueenie. Possibly. Um, and I, brought, I think it's going around the Keller Williams world. That's where it came yeah, from. So I'll, I'll forward this one to you because I, I did have that. Awesome. Thank you. So also monthly tracking. We've talked about this a couple of times. Track your profit and loss. You can use the software. You can use the Excel document. You're going to track your budget versus your actual. So your actual income and expenses versus what you budgeted for the year. So we don't want to just sit down and, and say we're going to spend $3,000 in advertising and never go back and look at it. You want to look at it on a monthly basis. What you would do is 
$3,000 divided by 12 would give you a monthly budget. Sit down and say, are you on track every month? Are you not? Where are you year to date? So not only looking at the monthly number, but you're looking at year to date. So we're now in, let's say, June. Let's say it was June. We would sit down and we'd say, okay, our monthly budget was 100. We're in June, so that's 600. Where am I year to date? Because we know some months we may spend a little less, some months we may spend a little more. So we don't want to get wrapped around the axle of what it is on a monthly basis, but rather um, kind of, box not anywhere, right? <laughs> kind of where we want to be, okay? So action plan. Uh, just like I think in the last training, sit down um, and find yourself one action you're going to take as a result today. Can we go around the room like we did last time? One action that you're going to take from today. I'm going to finish dealing with my budget for the year. Part way awesome. down. I'm not, I'm not all the way down. I'm going to finish dealing right. with You have a lot of changes. Yes. So awesome. Yeah. Happy to hear that. Aubrey. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. I'm just going to go for it. Oh, perfect. Hi, Laura. How have you snuck in late? Hi, I missed the half. half That's OK. Finish. I'm going to send out the slides, OK? Yeah. Um, so I will ask of you then. Um, Mariana, what are you going to do from today's class? Um, well, I'm going to explore a little more, like, uh, like the spreadsheet that I had. Um, probably should be changed maybe to Excel or even QuickBooks. Yeah. And, uh, do some research and awesome. And I'm here. You. you can send me a note. You can give me a call. I think you have my cell phone. You can call me anytime. And we can look at all of you. Can, we can look at anything anytime. I'm happy to sit down one-on-one -on -one and and get you going in a right direction, whatever that may be for you, or kind of help you tweak something to, to say, you know, here's, here's where you want to get to. I also know that Arresta um, is able to sit down with people and, and plug in numbers into the CGI calculator to figure out what it is that you need to make in order to get where you want as well. Paul? Um, I think uh, next year I'm going to make a couple changes to my spreadsheet just to make it kind of more compliant with the way that you know, CRA would look at things and like just like you said, like adding like that total income. So I don't, I usually put the like what I get paid rather than the total and then include right. the brokerage. Awesome. Although I have a separate spreadsheet to track my sales. It's awesome to do that. that though. You really want to understand what the total income is yeah. and then what it costs you to be in business with us, which yeah. is the cost of sales, and then that will give you your your first line net income, right? And then you take that net income and then that starts deducting out. So it might be just as easy as putting another subsection, two subsections at the top. Uh, residential commercial income, having a total income there, which is what your gross is on, on the deal. Yeah. And then doing another little subsection like in the beginning there that had cost of sales, which you would put royalty and then company dollar. And then it would, it would subtract out and then that would be your, what you would actually receive at home. Yeah. And then you would have another section too if anybody contributes to Gated Who Cares. You'd make sure you want to allocate for that. Or um, if you have a transaction fee, that is a cost of goods sold, which is why I changed it from the way it was being done when I came here. They were adding it to your expenses. It's not an expense, it's a cost of sale. Right? So that now is on your deal as a cost of sale. So that would be another one you want to put in a transaction fee. That only happens when you're capped. Yeah, I mean, there's there's sort of like maybe at some point I'll you know I'd even maybe show you my kind of spreadsheet because I yeah. the way I've done it it's great and it works for me. Um, I don't know whether necessarily it would be something that works for for everybody else okay. and stuff. Um, but you know, like when I enter the numbers in, like I even have a I let the system automatically deduct thirty five percent for income tax. Yeah, and then perfect. the remaining flows into my personal budget. Yeah. So I kind of base some awesome. on that. And then I have to make adjustments later. The one thing that I would like to kind of figure out a little bit more about is just sort of guidelines on what is a reasonable expense for people and, and deducting expenses. Like just like you said, and I mean again, you know, I mean not to you know, do anything that's not correct, but, yeah. you know, a lot of people are deducting, you know, sort of meal expenses and stuff like that. Like, what is a reasonable to expect? Yeah, that so, sense? Like, and what? I have, I gave this to you as well, so that'll kind of give you a good start. Um, there's one called Real Estate Tax Deductions Checklist that I gave you. Um, that's kind of a good start that gives you a lot of things that people may overlook as they are tax deductible and they are expenses that can be written off. 
Um, just one thing I want to note to everybody, if anybody ever wants to come in and talk to me about their personal financial situation, just give me a heads up so I can make sure we have this back boardroom. I don't like to talk in my office because I do have that open office. Um, and I don't find it's fair to you guys as the agents to be discussing personal stuff there. So if anybody wants to come in and have a conversation, we can meet in this back boardroom, which is a bit more private. Just give me a heads up and I'll make sure I grab it. Or I can meet off site for somebody if they need to, okay? Ernie, can share one thing? Uh, I'm going to fine tune my spreadsheet just so I can get more detail with the expenses. And awesome. Investigate QuickBooks for sure. Awesome. I love to hear it because we know we're finishing up 2018, we're going into 2019. Um, see a lot of bright shining faces in this room and I'm so excited to see where you all are going to go for 2019. So I think the number one thing we all have to work together on is making sure that we are set up to be successful, we understand where our businesses are and how they're running, and that way we can make the most that we can in 2019. Awesome? Thanks everybody. Thank you. So Thank don't you. Get